Welcome to the Weekly Artifact. This is a tri-weekly podcast created by two friends who met in undergrad and, against all odds, decided to keep talking to each other. I'm your host, Alex, joined always by my co-host, whose father won the approval of by roasting his son in a fantasy football group chat. I'm Justin. The internet moves fast. The hot takes of today are less than distant memory by tomorrow. We're here to slow down and recover the content that's been lost along the way in order to make sense of where the world was, where it is, and where it will be. To that end, we've each chosen an artifact from the web to discuss together. Our comments are our own and not associated with any institution. The show may contain explicit language or themes, so see the show notes for specific content warnings. Justin, what's your uh, artifact today, bud? So my artifact today is an article from Current Affairs magazine. Uh, It's called How Identity Became a Weapon Against the Left. It's from 2017, and it is by Brianna Joy Gray, who uh, was at the time and is uh, currently now uh, a associated with current affairs, but uh, obviously took a break to be uh, Bernie's press secretary. Okay, so the article is actually very timely in a weird way. Again, I, yeah, I'm really enjoying the new uh, conceit of this season with picking all this stuff and seeing how it's still timely because it just happens to be largely about Kamala Harris, although it's about other stuff as well. Um, and obviously, she was, you know, she's been sort of a, a figure or in the news for several years. So it didn't come out of nowhere. But um, obviously, not, you know, now with the news that she's the VP pick. Yeah. So it's basically the article is talking about identity politics and sort of when it's good and when it's not so good. So it kind of opens up saying how identity politics can be important it you know the the opening sentence is having an an identity politics is incredibly beneficial and we're thinking about how different communities are affected in in different ways um talks about there's lots of links to other articles and stories but like how the foreclosure crisis disproportionately hurt black americans um different sorts of what are called hidden taxes that affect women um things like that so so that's all very important but then um, she says if identity becomes synonymous with a perspective dissenting members within the identity group risk having their viewpoints erased and their humanity diminished and when used cynically as a political weapon a simplistic view of identity can allow people of a particular political faction to wrongly imply that they speak for all members of their racial or gender group so that's sort of um, the thesis, like identity is important, but we shouldn't allow you know one definition of identity to erase others, um, and that's sort of when it gets into talking about Kamala Harris and her history um, with basically the prison industrial complex and mass incarceration, um, and uh, uh, Brian Joy Gray points out how this is sort of in direct tension with the goals of the Black Lives Matter movement, and even more so in the most recent sort of Black Lives Matter protests that are very specifically about defunding the police and and things like that. But it really, it goes through sort of Harris's whole history, how she defended the state against court orders to reduce prison population. She tried to block a court decision requiring the state to provide a transgender inmate with gender reassignment surgery, uh, opposed a measure to require independent inquiries into police uses of force, obstructed efforts by federal judges to hold California prosecutors accountable for an epidemic of misconduct, bringing criminal charges against parents whose children miss school. So yeah, so and, and has you know links to all these different stories in there. Yeah. So, and then, and then putting that in contrast to how she, you know, did not prosecute uh, Steve Mnuchin for um, some of his foreclosure crimes. So, going after a lot of poor black and brown people, and not really going after uh, these, you know, high, you know, white collar crimes. Yeah. And then even even mentions that Steve Mnuchin gave Harris a campaign donation. Then uh, it also talks about um, Hillary Clinton and sort of how 
certain people would try and defend her record by basically accusing her her critics of being sexist. She's uh, a lady, folks. <laughs> a girl boss, if you will. <laughs> Yeah, I won't get all into her whole record. You can read the article for that, but um, sort of goes along a similar line, pointing out issues where you know she maybe is not as pro women as um, some would like you to believe. Uh, and then also contrast that with Bernie Sanders and how he sort of becomes a target for attack uh, as being sort of you know. Jewish. Not woke and <laughs> oh no, the other ones Sorry. <clears throat> and, and stuff like that. Uh, almost seemingly because he's a white man, even though when you then look at his record, you know he does you know support a lot of social justice policies and even has a lot of support among you know African Americans and women things like that. So yeah, and then it kind of gets into how people then who sort of um go against this sort of narrative get erased um you know like the bernie bro narrative tends to say that bernie supporters are all white men despite the fact that there's plenty of women and people of color and women of color names a few rosario dawson ben jealous pramila jayapal eddie Gloud, spike lee killer mike cornell west and turner i'll just briefly mention leslie lee the third who we've talked about before on the the show gets mentioned in the article. You can uh, read it to see how he factors in there. Yeah, so basically just saying that, you know, it doesn't, you know, just because a politician is black or a woman or whatever doesn't necessarily mean that they have the best policies for, you know, people who look like them and that we should sort of think more critically about people's policies and not just their identity. Yeah, I thought another interesting part was sort of, she says, uh, Failure to recognize that fact can result in dangerous consequences. It can lead us to support policies contrary to the best interests of the community simply because of optics, and it can turn us into a firewall to lean on rather than constituency to be one. So I'll return to that, but I think we see that a little bit with the DNC going on right now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I'll just summarize what her what point she makes towards the end where she talks about that we must rely on uh, something more than identity and when we're thinking about criticism of a, of a candidate and you know, at the end of the day it is fair to ask why is this person critiquing you know if, if, if the politician is a woman or a person of color or whatever you know we can ask questions about why they're being critiqued but we should you know decide whether the critique has merit not simply you know dismiss it because they are critiquing a, a person of color or a woman um, mm -hmm. And similarly, we shouldn't, you know, ignore our critics just because of their own identity for the same reason. So, so yeah, sort of trying to parse out identity from criticism. And... I've been personally validated by Brianna. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's the article. Um, like I said, I think um, I really like it just because of how timely it is even being, you know, almost a full three years old by now, or, you know, it will be a full three years old by the time this comes out, but it, the article is so well written, I almost don't have a whole lot to uh, sort of add to it um, other than just to sort of talk about some of the sort of current, how this sort of is playing out in our current moment. Mm -hmm. I think we do see there's a lot of sort of positioning of like the Biden Harris team as being woke or leftist or whatever, just because, you know, they're kind of put in comparison to Trump, but then also, you know, kind of just because of, I mean, I don't know. I, I think there's been some debate over, is Harris is kind of a, a strange figure because there's been, you know, people are like, oh, well, she's not really African American, you know, she's, well, has one parent from india one parent from jamaica so i mean she so even if she's black she's not really like african-american she's like an immigrant or whatever so i don't know so then it's so it gets kind of complicated for that reason so i feel like that maybe has drowned out a little bit of the typical identity politics mm -hmm. debate but mm -hmm. but yeah there's definitely i feel like a some of a lack of criticism from some people about sort of her policies for sure, but what are, you, what are your thoughts on this? I liked the 
um, some of the references that she made to sort of the 2016 election about like who sort of more towed the line, like the company line of like the Democrats and sort of buying into the identity politics where like she says like uh, Gloria Steinem, who we've talked about before as being a spook, uh, wouldn't have the quip that the young woman who supported Bernie must be in it for the boys, which is just like ass and concerning like the context, like the history behind who she is. But I like the one line that she said where it was like, um, Race produces her the like line. Race produces a set of lived experiences and form a political perspective, but identity cannot be used as a mitigating factor for political shortcomings. At a glance, the unusually diverse 2016 Republican Party field illustrated as much. If we believe that a political candidate's identity overrides their substantive beliefs and policy prescriptions, then a Ben Carson and Carly Fiorina ticket would have been a progressive's dream. And so, just like I mean, I mean, she says she uses that like sort of like uh often used often ignored line of like black people aren't black people aren't a monolith at joe biden but um <laughs> i just think i mean it's nice it's interesting to see sort of i mean it's only been four years but again every election is the most important election of our lives and every uh person will always be doing the same thing four years from now anyways it's like nothing's new but like it's also good to like it's good to be reminded that like this is the same like sort of bullshit conversation we've been having in the sense that like bullshit in the sense of like people like trying to act like you know if you if you don't vote for me you ain't black he says the white man but <laughs> but yeah i mean that was the uh yeah because i mean the if you don't you know if you're i think he's basically saying like yeah if you're debating between me and trump you ain't black or whatever but uh but yeah i mean we do that's in this article too pretty i mean not that exact line obviously but with the whole uh you know hashtag bernie made me white thing yes basically basically the same thing where it's like you know and i i, I didn't experience that exactly exactly but there's definitely people who will sort of you know if you don't say you know, if you say something that's sort of contrary, something that a liberal finds, like, that goes against their sort of beliefs, then they sort of just assume that you are, like, a white man mm -hmm. or whatever. Like, people will be like, oh, like, people sort of uh, accuse me of being, like, a Trump supporter online or something, <laughs> you yeah. know, because Watching I... Bob, bro. I don't know, it's very strange, because she is actually a very good speaker. Um, someone I saw, um, I think it was... Uh, Ring of Fire, the the YouTube channel, Fair and Cousins made the point where it's like she actually does do the one thing that Biden doesn't do, which is just being able to form sentences. Coherency. Yeah, <laughs> she has so many things that are I'm tempted to call gas, but no, she actually just means them. <laughs> like there's the uh, you know clip where she's laughing about oh you know God. threatening to send parents. I to the got general. a badge. I'm gonna use it. They're like, oh, the <laughs> cops are coming. <laughs> yeah, she's like, yeah. And then she called her children in the living room and said, Kamal's going to send us to jail. <laughs> just like laughing about classic it. comedy. <laughs> um, you know, police states. Yeah. <laughs> so um but but yeah i mean I was, I was just saying how yeah i mean you definitely will get you know people just assume your identity and your politics if you you know dare to criticize joe biden or whatever so yeah i mean like you said same same exact conversation just slightly different wording on them happening the other thing I was just going to say about the DNC thing is like, yeah, you see where they sort of just assume that, you know, people of color and people on, on the left generally are just sort of going to be there for them, which, I mean, I don't know, to some extent, I guess that's sort of true. Obviously, it kind of backfired for Clinton, but she still did win the popular vote, so obviously people didn't abandon her en masse but maybe enough to sort of sway the election in Trump's favor. But in any case, it's very clear the Democrats don't think they need to appeal to uh, anyone to their left by virtue of the fact that they've had, well, at least, I think they've had like seven Republicans or something speak Jeez, at the, between the, I think they had three on the first day and four on the second day or something like that. Um, either like Republicans or CEOs of, you know these companies like the the Hewlett yeah. Packard uh, CEO <laughs> spoke at the yeah. the thing or whatever. I know John Kasich has as well. Colin Powell, uh, Meg Whitman, the CEO of Quibi I, that uh, spoke. Uh, yep, 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 yeah. yep, 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 yep. The failed company Quibi. <laughs> 
Yeah, so I mean, it's very clear that they're, uh, you know, who they're appealing to, and it's not, you know, it's, it's not you or me for sure. So, yeah, I mean, you, it gets into two, like, questions of who you should vote for, blah, blah, which are, you know, we don't necessarily need to get into now. But, yeah, I don't know. I feel like our, our discussion in the article doesn't fully do it justice because, it, like I said, it is pretty well written. I, I, don't, I feel like I really, really good. I don't have a whole lot to add to it outside of uh, some of the, the points that made. I mean, yeah, I think it, it just is like a, a very interesting way to sort of mm-hmm. potentially radically reconsider how we think about identity and what the relationship between identity and politics is. And, you know, so definitely read it. But, uh, but yeah, that's all I got for my artifact this week. Alex, what's your artifact? So my artifact is a YouTube video from 2013. Why are bad words bad? By a Vsauce, um, hosted by Michael Stevens. Um, and it's sort of going into the use, the history, and the sort of different stories behind some bad words, curses, defamatory language. Um, and he starts off just by saying even the word bad itself uh, used to be derogatory in Old English for an effeminate man. Um, he starts out giving some statistics, like 80% of bad words heard in public from in 1986, 1997, and 2006 were essentially the same. A third of all of those swears also being the top two being fuck or shit. Uh, 0.7% of daily English speaking usage is taken up by these words. And he says it's a pretty close approximation to 1% of first person plural pronouns, such as we, us, and our. And then he sort of transitions into sort of talking about why people use bad words. And he cites a different article, or I guess it's speaker, Lolita Express alum Steven Pinker cites uh, five different uses being abusive, emphatic, dysphemism, idiomatic, and cathartic. Uh, abusive being, you know, sort of what we sort of generally consider, I guess, bad word usage was just sort of just like words that are bad on purpose, you know, created to hurt others. Um, and then he sort of does a subheading, which I didn't know about, which was the supernatural swearing, um, which is, you know, like God's vain and name in vain or just casual use of God's name. And in Victorian times, people would believe that that would physically injure God himself. It's like, God damn, I hope that's true. You know what I mean, Justin? Just like, <laughs> you punch up a little bit for once, you know? It's like, fuck <laughs> God. And then he like, just like, like, say, fuck you, God. And then he just like gets one in the fucking nuts or something. That's great. <laughs> Um, second is emphatic swearing, you know, which is to sort of em- like emphasize, um, you know, alert the, your peers that what you're talking about is more pressing than just what social norms would say how you should speak. For example, um, Justin's a fucker, not just like Justin's like a bad dude. Like you really, you know, you just want to let him know how much of a fucker or a bad dude you are. You got to say fucker. Uh, <laughs> diff- <laughs> Diphemism, which is sort of the exact opposite of a euphemism, which are used to sort of um, put like kitty gloves on bad or taboo topics. So this way you would use it to convey negative feelings, like especially towards something when you don't necessarily have to. And the example he uses is like, instead of saying a bag full of dog feces, uh, you would say it's a shit bag of dog shit. Idiomatic for number four, um, which is say like nothing is meant to be emphasized, but instead just convey like sort of relaxed nature among people comfortable with each other past sort of you know, rigid formalities, which is sort of the whole gist of my half of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and then cathartic, um, which is sort of a more scientific clinical sort of usage, which is that swearing is meant to give, can give uh, relief when in pain. This is medically known as lalochesia. And he sort of starts to break down the science of it, where swearing involves different regions of the brain, um, where swearing is centralized in the limbic system where emotions are found. Um, and he sort of compares this to automatic noises animals make sort of to intimidate or alert or scared in pain. And sort of the taboo of swearing works in the same way to alert other people that something's out of the ordinary here. Um, and I think the most interesting thing that he talks about next is sort of, or that he sort of talks throughout is that how class difference, um, does a lot to decide which words are and aren't crass or derogatory or bad words, quote unquote. Um, and the example he gives is in medieval England, the lower class Saxons spoke a Germanic language and the upper class Normans spoke a sort of language that would be related to French and Latin today. And so the consequences of this were like the poor farm hands that worked with the livestock is where we get words for cow, chicken, and pig. And that the rich that would only sort of interact with the animals once they're being prepared and eaten um, is where we get the words for beef, poultry, and pork. Um, and like defecate is Latin and shit is Germanic. So 
because the poor would say it, those are the words that, you know, you're not supposed to say now. And so these sort of repercussions that we, you know, the history's forgotten of and sort of all. And then, you know, finally he talks about how swearing has changed and how, while actually swearing itself will not, um, you know, will we'll still maintain its usefulness. So we probably won't stop swearing at all. The words that will be continued considered derogatory are changing. Um, so recently in recent history, words related to the supernatural, to sex and disease are less taboo as they become more common with sort of disease control and sort of an open discussion of sex and different relief uh, belief bases. Um, and then words that were once commonly used are becoming more unpleasant. And the examples they give um, are not necessarily due to political correctness um, being run amok, but that a greater knowledge and like sort of understanding and I think empathy um, is why that we wouldn't use the words that he offers are schizo, mental, Aspie, and even something like depressed may become part of the lexicon. And then sort of on the other side, sort of um, besides like a sort of mental illness, um, he cites linguist John McWater uh, ventures that words that denote class divides become more taboo, like salt of the earth, trash, and urban. And he sort of finishes off with just sort of a last uh, thought of like, why like just sort of trying to answer the question of why are bad words bad like asking like sort of rhetorically but like is it censorship is it an effort to make sure some words aren't blunted down to have as little effect as every other part of the language or is the badness a boundary that we are rejecting but we're ultimately sort of moving towards the direction of acceptance um it's an interesting article or an artifact it's an interesting video um that sort of gives some sort of concrete backing to some like you know why is this word bad why is this word you know not and i guess i'll let you speak first just to sort of give your thoughts but i mean there's a couple of things that i will mention if you don't you're you're clicking a lot at the end there but uh, fuck <laughs> man i just go for it okay so yeah i thought uh, there was a couple interesting things about this article uh i just this is our artifact uh, whatever but uh you just start calling everything articles no matter what but uh, yeah. <laughs> no, just kidding. But uh, yeah, it was interesting though that he cites uh, John McWater and Steven Pinker just because I feel like they're sort of both these like politically centrist type figures. But but that has nothing to do with the uh, video. But I was just like, I, I I do I actually like Lexicon Valley. But if you read John McWater's like political writings, they're yeah, they're just not that great. And then Steven Pinker is just like this guy was like everything's getting better you just like if you look at the numbers like everything's mm -hmm. good i think but anyways but uh so, but it was just kind of shitty to see them, them as like sort of like the main two sources here but but as to the actual content of the uh article i think one thing that i thought was interesting i, I don't really have any commentary on it but it was just one thing i always sort of wondered what was sort of the swearing as kind of like an animal growl almost because mm. i always sort of wondered like it does seem like he talks about different like mental conditions that will sort of like cause people to swear, even if they, you know, don't necessarily have like other sort of command of language. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I always sort of like wondered about that and why that could be a thing. But yeah, it sort of makes sense in the context of, I guess, just thinking about like where it ends up getting stored in the brain. And even I do remember watching that. Mythbusters episode, which by the mm -hmm. way, rest in peace to Grant Imahara. But uh, he, but yeah, I do remember that, and so yeah, that was kind of an interesting uh, thing to learn, and sort of like helps explain some things that I didn't know about. But um, I think the other thing, uh, other than sort of the conclusion of the video, which we can talk about more, I think the mm -hmm. other thing that was sort of interesting, which which is why like about this. What we're doing this season by trying to intentionally pick stuff that's a little bit older. Mm -hmm. I mean, we picked some old stuff before, but we're trying to be more intentional. But yeah. was sort of when he started talking about like what words will sort of become um, swear yeah. words. But yeah, so it's sort of interesting. Like I said, I, yeah, I mean, I was definitely like alive and cognizant in you know seven years ago, but I, I don't really remember like where are those words. More accept. I mean, I assume they're probably more acceptable, but were they actually like acceptable? I'm not. I, I don't know. Do you mm -hmm. have any any sense? Of, I mean, you said you sort of had like a visceral reaction to it. Like it had to. I mean, like if you watch any sitcom from the 2010s, you're just like, Jesus, really? Like there's a <laughs> lot, but it seems like it seems like I'm sure people were like, Hey, man, don't do that. But like 
I think your typical boss tonight would just be throwing that around. No <laughs> business. <laughs> Although I do think that they're, I don't know, it's sort of interesting thinking about what is sort of, uh, maybe even this distinction between like a swear word and just a bad word. I don't know, because, I mean, if you, you know, he was talking about the Steven Pinker sort of distinctions, and mm-hmm. the, I think the first one was sort of like words that are kind of like meant to like exclude people. I guess they could be thrown in that category, but they're definitely yeah. not swear words in the way of words that you would sort of use to sound cool <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. Which I feel like most, even the words that are kind of exclusionary, I sort of feel like, at least in some context, someone out there thinks that it still is kind of cool to use the word. Maybe oh, it's yeah. changing, though. Um, so, I, I don't know. I think it sort of does seem to be in like a gray area where there's... I mean, maybe it could just be our sort of entire conception of bad words is sort of changing. Maybe bad words are just like not as cool now. Is it kind of interesting when he said, like, will trash sort of become mm-hmm. a taboo word? Which I actually do know people who really don't like when you say, call, like, use trash as, like, an adjective, especially, like, describe someone. But, I, uh, I've only ever... It makes a lot of sense when it's, like, white trash, but, like, just trash by itself seems like it's just another word for garbage. Like, I don't really... I guess I don't understand the repercussions to using trash by itself. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's kind of just, like, people are, it, people like see it as, like... Yeah, yeah, pretty much, like, you're just saying, like, that they have, like, no worth at all, and, like, you're not seeing, like, you know, just because they're... That is what I'm trying to say. Like, I, <laughs> like, yeah, it's super, it's very, like, aggressive and mean to say that, but, like, I meant it. I don't know. <laughs> like, it's, yeah, because that was, I don't know, I guess something, like, words that use like that, like, I'm never, like, gonna, if, if, you, if any, if it can be used equally among any person, then, like, I think it's fine. <laughs> my, I think my like code for like uh, vulgarities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I do think that that was kind of interesting. Cause I, I can I could easily see that being sort of one of mm-hmm. the words that goes. Yeah. But uh, uh, the other one that was interesting, I won't talk about all of them, but uh, or I don't know, we can't. If we want, but uh, <laughs> de- depressed was an interesting one too. Because I don't really feel like I feel like if anything, that's become actually more accepted now. I think, it would it been has, I think that's that feels like yeah, I feel like that's a bigger part of the sort of normalizing like the mental health like stigma and stuff like that. Not don't normalize the stigma. Normalizing mental health <laughs> in the face of the stigma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean I still think that that's like I mean that feels like something that like don't say around like, you know, your grandparents or something. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I mean it's like a word yeah, I definitely feel like older people uh there's like a generational Divide on how people view mental health, but I don't. I don't see depressed becoming like a bad word. The thing that I kind of thought funny. I'm not like trying to like. So this is, this is not like a gotcha moment for me against Vsauce with their 18 million subscribers and my one listener of Justin. Um, but he when he talks about the anti bully campaign or the the no swearing club, <laughs> um, he says like yeah he got harassed online for being uncool and lame, but like lame has like a history of like uh ableist language in it too so it's just like weird to see like how even some things get past him during the because i don't think that was intentional you know what i mean mm-hmm. yeah of just like how like some things are so normalized and like have gotten become part of like just regular speak that it's not you know he didn't even bad eye about like referring like somebody else referring to that thing as lame is not being something worth bringing up yeah I mean, I, yeah, I definitely feel like in the last seven years, people have been talking about ableism a lot more. I mean, some of this could just be, like, me getting older and exposed to more stuff, too. But mm-hmm. I definitely, I mean, I even remember, like, there people didn't even really, like, know, especially with, like, mental disabilities. I, I know yeah. lame refers more like a physical disability, but... Um, that people wouldn't even know, like, is this like, is this what I'm supposed to be saying? Is this not what I'm supposed mm-hmm. to be saying? Whatever. I do feel like that has made kind of leaps in, in the last seven years. But yeah, so, but I'm just saying, like, that could have been another example of something that just wasn't even really on the radar right. in 2013. And it's not, not saying that it wasn't on anyone's radar, but, you know, not on his radar. It's funny you should mention that because not being on the radar is one of the best qualities of a safe room.
So now that we're in our safe room, Alex, what's on your mind? What's on my mind is uh, don't do bits with strangers, which a bit in the sense of like a small like joking thing, like assuming that like anybody's son of a bitch. <laughs> I think I'm all right. Nice safe room this week, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> you motherfucker. Which is to say, don't assume that somebody that you don't know, like, is in a mood or a position or likes you enough or is even neutral enough with you to like want to like yes and whatever like horseshit you're on. Uh, the two concrete examples is about a week ago. I picked about up a week ago. <sighs> One of these, you're really you're feisty today, huh, Justin? <laughs> Sorry, I just I need to that's, keep you know I need to keep uh, the meme alive. That's the th- I I do that a lot too, and I just I never would have like seen it doing it myself. So I'm glad you're keeping me honest. Uh jeez, that I was out of nowhere. That hit me like a fucking semi truck in the chest. <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> I'm really you really frazzled me. I gotta like completely refocus now. The co- two concrete examples and one of them is like even more like damning than the first the first one was sort of just in two neutral parties me and a person that lives close to me like a neighbor um i was coming i got out of my car with a pizza that i got because i was hungry and i was hungry and it was hot and i was not in a good mood and this elderly woman was like oh thanks but what did you get for you and she was just on her like front lawn i was like Ha ha ha! I'll get you next time. <laughs> and then I like r- sprinted in my house and had like eight slices of pizza to myself. To start. Like, I just like, man, I didn't sign up for that. I like, I every goddamn day, and like it's that by itself is kind of annoying, but pretty, you know, uh, inoffensive. But the real problem is when you work, especially in customer service, and and I'm gonna say I'm gonna say it not. This is not just a customer problem. This is also a coworker problem of like, you know, we're in quarantine now. We probably still will be. The one good thing about the U.S. not doing anything is you can't date these podcasts based on us being in quarantine or not. So uh, <laughs> we have to wear masks at work and so do the customers because our state mandates it. Your state. My state mandates it. The, you know, any face covering will do. And so... A coworker of mine was wearing like a sort of bandana around his the lower half of his face, and another customer was wearing a bandana on the lower half of his face, and he sort of walks in. My coworker's about twenty three. I'm about there, a little older. The guy that's talking to us is like thirty five at least, and he goes, "Ah, it's a couple of banditos working today, huh?" <laughs> and my coworker's like, "What?" He's just like, "Not." Nah. And he's like, "Yeah, you know, man." And he just sort of like points at both the bandana. He goes, "Yeah, ha ha ha." And then he's getting roast beef. Somebody orders roast beef. You offer them complimentary au jus. And I need to clarify that for the joke because I say, would you like au jus with that? And he says, you just call me a Jew? And I'm like, man, it's like 10 a.m. Can we just like, I don't, don't accuse me of a hate crime right now, man. Like, I just, I don't want it. And then he looks at the other guy that with the other man. He's like, ah, I'm just, I'm just razzing him. And my coworker's like, yeah, man, anything else? Like... <laughs> And like, so like, that's the worst, case. that's absolutely worst case scenario is getting accused of a hate crime. But also like anytime somebody's like, Hey man, <laughs> like, can I get you anything else? And they're just like, yeah, a million bucks. <laughs> Me too. Like I'm being, I have to be, I'm getting paid. I have to be here. This is my job. You don't have to be here. Fuck off customer. <laughs> like go away. You've done your job. You're wa- you're spending time and money. You're wasting everybody else's time, including your own being here. And to the co-workers, eh, I'm not going to make life harder for anybody working here, but, like, I'm also, like, not your, like, I have to be here, you know? Like, I, I wouldn't be hanging out with you if I wasn't getting paid to. <laughs> so let's, just, let's just assume that that's the relationship indefinitely. If I'm like, do you want to hang out after work? Then you can assume that I enjoy spending time with you. But if, I, if I'm getting paid to stand next to you, don't assume that I want to be here. You know, I think that's just a fair rule for everybody. Yeah. Customers and coworkers alike feels like a, just a good thing to keep it aware of. Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't necessarily mind if a, a, a well placed joke every now and then, but it just gets me the people who like you know think that this is their time to show off their tight five or whatever. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> like, the tightest fives, dude. <laughs> or they just show up and it's like, 
beginning to end they're just trying like crack jokes it's like most you're not a professional comedian like you know right, that's a thing like i i I, I, be here. I appreciate the customers that are you know trying to you know I, I'll, I'll take that over the customer that's just being like an asshole but uh, oh, I'd I'd rather keep it light over like I said f- half a pound. This is point five one, or the one that's like, yeah, my mom just died and I can't see her. I don't know what to do. Weeping, I was like, man, I don't know either. I don't know either. <laughs> yeah. I'm making I'm making minimum wage. You think I know what to do about this? No. <laughs> but yeah, Fuck. it just becomes like I don't know if they don't realize like how awkward it is because it's like I don't have like. Do you want me to make a joke back? Because they're like approximating like a friendship or something. But when it's yeah. really like, I don't know you. Like, I'm not gonna say anything that's gonna like. I like basically you just want you're trying to just like follow a script at, at that point. Yeah. It's like you know if you because if you go off script, who knows what's gonna happen? So it's like, oh, yeah. but it's like it seems like you're trying to like banter with me, but like we're not. I not in position to banter even so i don't know what you think's gonna happen here like <laughs> you're not ready for this heat old man you really don't want to do this with me because <laughs> <laughs> the roast is about to start and i promise mm-hmm. i'm gonna be leaving here with a customer complaint by day's end <laughs> yeah or yeah or even with like the neighbor it's like i don't know maybe like trying to establish some sort of rapport first maybe yeah uh, like you said it's, it's yeah, not that like was a- not as bad though I, I don't really have much of a problem with it but it just gets me where it's like i don't know how you're supposed to respond in those situations well, that's, there's no but like with th- something like that like the the real problem is sort of like the in that instance is like the joke itself because i like my neighbor we say hi and stuff and you know wave each other how's it going nice weather da, da, da. but like those kind of bits like oh thanks for me like i don't you leave me no wiggle room here <laughs> right <laughs> like there's no good answer to that besides ha huh! and just keep walking like i can't <laughs> i wish i could yes and you but i can't I don't know. It's fine. It's just it just it just is. All right, Justin. Uh, I feel better. What's uh What's on your mind today? What's your safe room? My safe room is that people should not amplify fringe voices, and I particularly like mean in the context of. <laughs> 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 uh, I particularly mean particularly mean in the context of sort of giving your opinion i guess so so where this is coming like out of <laughs> listen you got me with that week ago i gotta do something <laughs> so, so what the, the, the specific context this is coming out of is the whole sort of quote-unquote discourse around the wop song no 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 justin this content may not be suitable. You say the goddamn title of that song right now. <laughs> I mean, isn't that the official title, though? Uh, yeah, that's the official title, Justin. What's a WAP? Because that sounds like a racial slur to the town if I heard one. So why don't you fucking uh, do a little better? Is that what you mean, Justin? Is that what a WAP is to you? Is that you know, the discourse you want to talk about? Or you want to specify what you're referring to? Yeah, what song are you referring to? I'm, I'm talking about the that racist Italian song that came out. What song are you <laughs> I'm talking about? I'm talking about those without papers. What are you talking about? <laughs> anyway, but uh, so wet ass pussy. <laughs> but <laughs> but I think uh, it, yeah, it feels like really no one has anything to say about the song itself, and so people just keep amplifying the couple of people who have like, don't like the song in order to, like, give themselves something to say. So it'll be, like, I don't know, it's, like, every time I hear someone talk about WAP, it, the conversation always starts with, like, oh, you know, can you believe all the people who are, like, upset about this song or whatever? It's, like, well, I haven't actually, like, I, I know of, like, two people who don't like the song. I don't know of anyone personally who doesn't like the song. I just know of, like, the two people on Twitter that you guys won't stop retweeting who don't like the song. <laughs> I actually don't know of any, like, as far as I know, like, 98% of people like this song or are just indifferent on it. Mm-hmm. But it's like, but I, like, I was listening to a whole podcast, and the podcast is actually a, a good podcast. It's the uh, Some Say podcast. But um, they, they basically, they spent the whole episode just talking about, basically, like, like that five-second Kylie Jenner cameo. Now, yeah. when I watched the video, I I didn't even know who that was. 
Uh, she's the only one I knew, and I was like, barely. I was like, I think that's her. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea. There's a couple of old heads, bro. I, just, I was like, oh, is this person have a featured verse or something? And then she, like, then obviously <laughs> nothing happens after that. So I was like, okay, yeah. that was kind of weird. I don't, I don't know who that was. I didn't know who anyone was except for Megan and Cardi. Uh, yeah. I, for sure yeah because the podcast they were like talking about all these cameos i'm like i literally did not recognize anyone other than megan and Cardi. but hey, that's not here nor there but yeah they were like they were like oh can you believe all these uh newspapers and magazines or whatever that are you know their headlines are about kylie jenner and then an hour later they were still talking about kylie jenner and it's like so <laughs> so you guys also don't have anything to say other than to talk about right. kylie jenner so like <laughs> what? But it feels like that's the whole sort of discourse around WAP. And again, I don't want to make this whole safe room about WAP, but I just feel like it's, it's the thing that's fresh. It's on my mind. I don't know. You but, got something against WAP, Justin? <laughs> anytime there's something where it's like people just feel like they need to have a take, their go to is so like, well, let me amplify some of like the fringe voices who have like a bad opinion on this in order to like make it seem like I have something to say about it. I've, heard, I've yet to actually hear anyone say anything about the song. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know if I have a hot take on the song. The beat's okay. I don't know. It's a little, like, they are better than the beat. That's my hot take. I, the beat's a little slow. I me. like, oh, yeah, the, 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 po- the Someone Say podcast was saying that they, if, if there's, you know, maybe, maybe it has something to do with the fact that clubs aren't really open right now or aren't open the same yeah. way. So well, it's it, definitely not a banger. Yeah, but they're saying, like, you know, once clubs do open up, their DJ's gonna have to, like, speed this up if people are actually gonna be oh. dancing to it. Yeah. But, uh, but I did, I did like the sample that they were using, and, uh, yeah, it just, it kind of just had, like, a, a very chill vibe to it. And, and that's pretty much all I have to say about the song. <laughs> like, yeah, right. <laughs> like, um, I, I want to get ahead of your side notes here quickly that, uh, WAP, while people uh, erroneously think that it stands for without papers, is actually an abbreviation of uh, Guapo. So, uh, so and also, because I mean, cause I, did you see the person tweet about that? How that was like, <laughs> why are we allowed? Why are these like black women allowed to use a, a, t- a slur against Italian Americans, <laughs> no. but I'm not allowed to say? And then just like dropped a hard R <laughs> in the middle of her text or tweet. No, I didn't see. No, she's like, what? Imagine if I had a song called and it was just like all caps, like hard R. And I was just like, yikes. <laughs> Also, yeah, because WAP is both, well, A, it's spelled W O P, and also it doesn't stand for without papers. It's abbreviation for Guapa or Guapo or whatever the fuck. So just so we're all clear on that. But yeah, so you got, you got some real hard discourse here. I think, well, I think to your broader point, though, it's like weird that like you can use like Ben Shapiro as a straw man argument, even though he exists. Like, it's like, man, yeah, these people just keep saying this. Like, now, like, one, just some dumbass with a fucking male testosterone energy pill company <laughs> thinks that his wife can only have a yeast infection to get turned on. Does not mean that the rest of us have to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I d- yeah, I did hear one take that was like, is actually good that he's getting dragged because his whole oh, brand yeah. is like being smart and now people will see that he's an idiot. I've also heard the opposite take that is like, don't even mention him because inevitably some people are gonna go to make fun of him, but then stay because I'm like, oh, actually, I kind of like how this guy is talking. Or never. Imagine going to Ben Shapiro and saying, "I like how this guy is talking." <laughs> but you're right. <laughs> Conclusion of this: You don't have to have a take. That's a you know, it's a point that they make on struggle session all the time. Yeah. Uh, but it's very true. Like everyone always just feels like they have to have a take. You really don't have to have a take. You know, don't so don't be like amplifying these fringe voices in order to make it seem like you have a take. Just just be fine saying like, I like the song. I didn't like the song. Uh, move on. Like we don't have to have like this national discourse about the song. Like it's a it's a chill song. It's fine. I'll probably listen to it again at some point. Uh, that's all I have to say. But the only thing worse than not the the only thing worse than insisting on having a take is needing to have a take off somebody else's take. Mm-hmm. It's a bad look. Mm-hmm. That's our show for this week. See the show notes for a link to view the artifacts for yourself and uh, view the end notes as well. Uh, music for the podcast was produced by Nicholas Pizzuto. Rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Facebook. Uh, tell a friend or enemy about the show. And join us again in three weeks as we find two new texts to discuss. You know, I mean, people on 
like the right will be like, you know, I as a white person should be able to say the N word or something. <laughs> like it's just obviously just kind of like stupid because right. I mean, they don't have like, but I mean, I, I think it's stupid because like they don't have like a reason to say it. They just want to say it to be racist basically. But cause I feel like for people on the left, a lot of times will be like, well, the reason you can't say it is because you're white, but like any black person could say it. Whereas I'm like, I don't really agree with that because, like, would not I would not be okay if Ben Carson was like, "Yeah, I just pass, I just like signed a new bill that's going to take all these n words and put them out on the street," and we're just like, "Oh, well, Ben Carson is black, so like, imagine, holy shit!" 